Let's get into it. We have a man here waiting for the Savior. Now, this shouldn't be a unique situation. Every Jewish person should have been waiting for the Savior. Why is it that Simeon's the only one mentioned? This should have been the Jewish way of living. I'm waiting for the Savior. My day off, every day, I'm, I'm praying, please, Lord, come. Oh, Lord, come. Please, Lord, save us. Luke describes this guy as being very different than everyone else. There may have been a few out there other waiting for the Savior. But at this point, this man is righteous and devout. Now, the word righteous is the word dikaios in the Greek. It means he didn't violate any of God's laws. Can you be in the category of being righteous? Please don't raise your hand too quickly, okay? Because my hand's going to have to stay down probably. I, all the time, we all make mistakes. We violate the things that God has for us. The direction that he wants for our lives, many times we'll skew it a few degrees to the left or right. I like generally what God wants me to do, but I don't know if I want to go that far with it. This man followed everything. He followed the laws of God to the letter. And he was devout. Ulabes. He was reverent. He was awed by God. Would that be you this morning, awed by God? If it is, then why do we live the lives we live? Why is it that most of us are having so much difficulty or this is the downtime of the year? If we're awed by God, no matter what comes, I'm thinking of the greatness of my God. This is this kind of man. This is Simeon. Again, would, would you fit in either of those categories or both? And I would love to see somebody who would fit in both. You know, I would say, man, that's the example I need to follow. And there are some sweet people in this room that when you speak, I listen every time. You may not know it. I'm not going to say, oh, by the way, you're speaking. I'm about to listen very closely. But you, I'm awed by you because of your walk with the Lord and the way that you see God. I want to learn from a many of you that way. Please understand I lift some of you up. You're my encouragement. You're my, you're my examples. But this man was righteous and devout, and he looked forward to Israel's consolation. Now, that's a big word. Most of us have no idea we'd have to go to a dictionary somewhere to find out what that means. But it's, in the Greek, it's the word paraklyson, and it means encouragement, exhortation. The hope, the comfort of Israel. For thousands of years they've been waiting. As we've already talked about our Advent uh, wreath here with the candles. They were waiting for this Messiah to come. They were waiting for the comfort and the hope, the encouragement of Israel. That's what that word consolation means. It's a, it's a hard word in the English, even though this is a fairly benign level. It's not like your 11th or 12th grade English level. They still threw in a big word that most of us don't have a reference for. Israel's without hope at this point. They need a savior to come. It needs encouragement, the whole nation. But let's be reminded that if you're not with the Lord this morning, you need comfort. You need hope. You're waiting for some kind of savior. Now, you may not know how to describe it. It may be you're thinking, I'm going to do this one thing and it will solve all of my problems, but usually all it is is one more thing to add to our problems. Again, they needed the Lord. We need the Lord just as much today. Israel needed encouragement. You need encouragement. And if you're having difficulty, I would encourage you to get back to God's Word. See who God is and just be awed by Him. The majesty of who He is, the greatness of our God because He is good. And he will work. If you were in, in Sunday school this morning, just talk about Joshua and, and God listening to him to extend an entire day. It's a powerful thing that God would listen to man, but he did. And he'll do that with you. Again, Simeon's life was different. And, and it's different in one unique way is that he had the Holy Spirit upon him. Now, you and I take that for granted today because we know very clearly from God's work when we follow the Lord and we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. The Lord is in us. God is here with us at all points. But we look at this situation, Jesus is still on earth and he's a baby. Now, many of us don't understand our theology or the, the timetable a lot, but we're going to ask the question, where did the Holy Spirit come from? I thought he came in Acts, the book of Acts, when the, the tongues came down and the Holy Spirit came upon everyone. That's what we're normally going to say. Well, the Holy Spirit comes about 30 years, 33, 34 years later. But no, I mean, look at you know, Acts 2, 4. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Essentially, though, he's been here from the beginning. 
And again, I haven't got time here. When we talked about creation, we've talked about the beginnings. Genesis 1, 6 is always a powerful verse. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We remember that the, the spirit hovered over the waters. From the beginning, at all points in history, even before there was time, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were working together to do God's work. The Holy Spirit has always been here, and therefore he's visited us plenty of times through the, through the history. And at this point, he's visiting a man 33 years before Jesus gives his life. This man knew the Lord. This man followed God. He was awed by God. It's amazing what the Lord will do for those who follow him closely. Just begin to be awed by God, and he will do amazing things in your life. He's just looking for someone he can spend time with and encourage. Most of us are so busy with the, the world, we never see beyond here. We put our, in our, our own little life in this little box. And yet God's saying, I want to remove that box for you. You just won't look to me to let you do that. Let me help you. The Holy Spirit told this guy, Simeon, that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. Neat story. So either he's going to live a lot longer or we know the Messiah is coming. Now, this is a double-edged sword. This is good and bad. The first thing we know is that he would live long enough to see the Messiah. What a beautiful thing. You know, if the Lord told you you're going to live long enough to see the Lord come back, wouldn't that be a powerful thing? That would be a beautiful thing. And and these people had waited for thousands of years. We've now waited for thousands of years for him to come back. Who knows? Could be in our lifetime. But he's going to live long enough. The problem here is, though, that when the Messiah comes, his life is over. It's ended. God gave him what he asked for. You will live long enough to see this Messiah. He's prayed all his life that he would see the hope for Israel, the consolation, God's anticipated deliverance. God gifted him with life long enough to accomplish that. What a beautiful gift. We see that God gives gifts all the time, all the way through God's word. He's giving gifts to people. And at Christmas, we want to give gifts. He's giving Simeon the opportunity to live long enough to see the one that he's prayed for all his life. Do you, do you have that kind of prayer life with the Lord? Do you, do you beg to see God like that? We know there is a crown, a special crown for those of us that are anticipating the Lord's return. Are you working toward that crown when we talk about Revelation? So we see that. But one of the interesting things, many of us, and it's not so common anymore, us, us younger ones and you younger guys behind me, we used to give fruit at Christmas. Anybody remember that was the big deal? There's some fan, fans, families, yes. Fruit was the big deal. People would give fruit baskets or cranberry sauce. We see that's part of a, of a Christmas meal, usually fruit. Again, many children at the turn of the century, the only fruit they would receive would be at Christmas in their stocking. Now, again, that may be still part of your tradition, which is, in, is a neat thing. But it started off at a time when there was no fruit. Fruit was difficult. I can imagine it really be kind of tough in New Mexico just because it's not what we do here. Those, those things come from water areas. But when you look at it, if we're, if we're looking at symbolism, what do the fruits remind us of? The fruits of the Spirit. Again, we, we remember those. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's very clear that he uses the word fruit, and we give fruit at Christmas. You see the symbolism of, of how we can make something that's worldly, just something that comes off of a tree, and make it something powerful. Again, the blessings that God gives us, once again, it comes back to gifts. When we come to the Lord, he gives us these special things. And I know many people, I've already heard people praying for things like self-control and, and the ability to have wisdom and strength and you know, the, all these things come when we come to the Lord. So if you're having trouble with that, maybe you root back to what you know. But we see that fruit is a, a powerful part of Christmas. We've always got fruit salads. And I always like the fruit salads with the whipped cream in it, not the fruit salad with mayonnaise or something. What are you? That's a South thing. You do that every time. And I'm always thinking it's the whipped cream with salad, and it's not. And it's just, but it's a good tra tradition for her. The fruits of the Spirit have nothing to do with Christmas. They have nothing, but they are gifts that come from the Lord, and they're powerful, and they are the ability for us to work with each other and do mighty things in the world. 
Can we use things like fruit at Christmas to be reminded and tell everyone, you know what, let me tell you, son, why you've got an orange in your stocking. Let me talk about the fruits of the Spirit for you. Let me remind you of the things that God gives us and the way that he encourages. So we see the gifts are anticipated. It's coming. Gifts are celebratory. Let's move on down in this a little bit. 27, 28. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and he praised God. And we're going to stop right there. Powerful, powerful. The Spirit led Simeon to the temple. It wouldn't have been a normal day he was worshiping. This rite that Jesus is going through would have happened just in a private area with a priest at that time or a rabbi. But let's, be, let's ask the interesting question. Where else would God have shown Simeon the next high priest? Where else but the temple? I mean, you remember Hebrews 5.10. I hope you do. Again, and he was declared, this is Jesus, by God, a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Such a powerful book, Hebrews. I love that book. It's just so deep. But where else would Simeon be led? I mean, he very easily could have been shopping in the town square, finding his his olives, and then run into Mary, who's holding a baby, trying to wrestle with olives, and where's Joseph? Why can't he be here when I need him? I need his help. That kind of a thing. Instead, they go to the temple, and the Spirit leads him there. When you look at it, Joseph was simply following Jewish customs. At six weeks of age, every firstborn baby was taken to the temple. And this comes from the law of Moses. It was one of those requirements called the Pidyon Haben, the redemption of the son. Numbers 8, 17, for every firstborn among the Israelites is mine, both man and animal. Jesus wants what Jesus, God wants what Jesus has. Jesus is his. And even though he gave him, Jesus is going to be consecrated back to him the traditional way that every firstborn has been for thousands of years. Simeon sees him, and the Holy Spirit says, oh, by the way, the one, that baby over there, that's the one. That baby's the one you've been waiting for. Can you imagine Simeon? Now, I, I imagine he's walking so closely with the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't have been shocked by seeing a baby. Now, you and I would probably walk in, where's the guy? Where is he? Some you know, strapping 25-year-old is ready to fight a good war. Where is he? He's the one. Who's, who's got the, that chiseled chin and the golden locks that flow in the wind? Which one is it? No, it's a baby. Again, and he picks him up and he praises God. The word praises God is the word ulagesa, and it means blessed, praise, well-chosen words, eloquence, or flattery. He is flattering God for doing the thing that he's promised to do for thousands of years. He's waited all his life. We don't know how old he is. He could be a young man. He could be old. We always see him as an old man who's lived a full life waiting for this this Savior to come. And he's praising God. That word ulages is where we get our word eulogy. And we do those at funerals. We say nice words about people who've passed away. Simeon was given a gift, and therefore he praised the giver. You see how beautiful this thing is? He received this beautiful gift of, of living long enough to see the promised Messiah. And he praised the one who gave him that gift. I mean, do you do that kind of a thing? It's always one of those things you want to teach your children to be good, good receivers of gifts. Always happy and always smiling. Thank you. It may be something they didn't want. But we should always be a grateful people. He was grateful for the opportunity he had. When you look at it, gifts are probably one of the few things we can connect right back to the manger. One of the rare ones. Everything else, trees, there may have been trees out there. They didn't decorate them like that. Probably no bows except tying off whatever it is around Jesus to keep him warm. None of those kind of things were there, but we see gifts. We all remember the wise men. They gave gold. It was a precious commodity, highly valuable, and they would need that in the future as they were traveling to Egypt and trying to protect Jesus from the leader of Jerusalem. They gave frankincense. It's a fragrance used in worship. You would have smelled this every time you entered the temple complex. Jesus was to be a sacrifice, and so we see that connection from the beginning. Why these guys would have given it, they probably were giving the most, best, most beautiful, precious things they had. Not understanding they're helping to fulfill tradition for Jesus, or at least show where he's going in the future. They gave myrrh. It's an embalming spice. It's made 
for also for a toxic drink. And we know that they gave gall to Jesus on the cross. We know these gifts were at the manger. This may be one of the only accessories of Christmas that can be traced back to the first Christmas. The wise men gave because their lives were full. Are your lives full this morning? Do you give because you have joy? That's what I love about Christmas is I'm, I'm able to, okay, I, yeah, I, I gripe about it because, oh, my goodness, can I provide for this? Where's the money coming from? I need this, plus I've got to pay the bills. But when it comes down to it, I love to give. It's my favorite thing. I just love to be able to give stuff, take care of people in different ways. In Matthew 2.11, the wise men were filled. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. And we've talked about this. They fell right there, prostrate on the floor, faces to the ground. That's the Greek wording is what that means. The book of Matthew is very clear that when you fulfill a need, you're doing something for the Lord. You're not doing it for yourself. Matthew 25, 40, And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Now, again, I think it's important that you give to your family and you give to your relatives and you give to your children and friends. I think that's a beautiful thing. But also understand there are people that need help above and beyond. You know, As a church, we feed, when they're here, 60-plus families a month. Because of what you do, we give food to 60-plus families a month. And that costs money. And when they need special things in addition, we try to help them there. When they need presents for Christmas, we try to help them there. All in your name, in the Lord's name, but through your special sacrificial giving. But the most important thing that we can give at Christmas is the message of Christ. When's the last time you shared Christ with anyone? I'm not asking you to raise a hand. Don't make me sad. Don't make me, oh, it's been 14 years. Oh, my goodness. But it may have been. When's the last time you shared the message of Christ? I don't want to beat you up, but I've got to ask this question to myself a lot. You know, we have the opportunity, even if we're not doing it verbally at the end of the service, to give to Lottie Moon to help missionaries to do something we can't do here. You can't go to some foreign country and share the message of Christ. It's probably not what you're called to do. But we can give a little bit so that they can do what they're called to do. Again, please understand that as a church, we do all we can to share this message and use your resources to do that. This is the one time of year I want to make sure if we can do it, let's do it well. Again, how are you helping other people at Christmas? You... Feeding anyone, again, at Thanksgiving, you gave so many neat things to help those families to have a good turkey dinner. But we have Christmas coming, and they would sure be able to have a nice Christmas dinner. Who knows? God gives, and we need to give. So gifts are anticipated. Gifts are celebratory. Thirdly, finally, gifts affect our lives. Let's go on to 29 to 32. Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation, and you've prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Simeon was changed, and therefore his life was over. He needed to see nothing else. It's, all, it's like, you know, when you, you want to always end on top. It's neat when you're like one of those great football players or baseball players. Last game, win the World Series, win the Super Bowl, I'm retiring. It's never fun when the next year you're like the 40th ranked team. That's never that much fun. You want to end out on top. And Simeon was able to end on top. His whole life had been this slow crescendo up to the most beautiful thing he could ever imagine. Would you and I think it as being that big a deal? His whole life was geared around seeing the Messiah. And we're able to walk and talk with him daily. And yet, we tend to take it pretty passe. The gift of God changed Simeon, but it also changes us. You know, he got to have his life affected in a powerful way. The the pinnacle, the top of everything that he had hoped for. Can you imagine ending on top? We have Christ today. We can accept him. We don't have to wait in the future, hoping our life We'll end at a point where we can see the Messiah. He has come. We're just waiting for him to come back again and make it all right and correct all the problems. The world is so sick. We need the Messiah. Please, Lord, come. That should be our daily prayer. Please, Lord, come. But until then, I'll continue to do what you've called me to do. 
We need to continue to give the gift of Christ, sharing the message of Christ everywhere we go, in all areas. Is that, am I asking you to, to memorize half the Bible and quote it to people? No, I don't want you to do that. I want you just to be you, living the best Christian life you can, walking with the Lord, because that's the greatest evangelistic tool you've got is your own life. It's easy to have a whole bunch of words and live like the enemy. That doesn't help anyone. But to just be a good example of joy and hope in difficult times, you will change all the lives around you. And then they'll come and ask, why are you always, I I know what you're going through. Why are you doing so well? Well, let me tell you, God's with me. I don't have to have a hundred quoted verses. The Lord is with me. Jesus loves me. And he's given me the hope to get through this thing. And then there's the conversation. This person trusts you because they actually came to you in the first place to find out how you're surviving the oncoming onslaught. We talk about giving. We talk about uh, Christmas. And there's one person I think I'm going to kind of get into some history of. You deal with this, this character as you choose. But we all have heard about Santa Claus. Now, he came from St. Nicholas. Now we're, it's an interesting story. But he was born around 280 and turkey he was a monk he gave away all of his inherited wealth he was very very wealthy he saw the poverty around him and he said it's important that i help others i can't have these poor people around me and not be able to sacrifice for others he gave away everything he could when you go a little later we see that saint nicholas was a, a popular saint Again, we weren't a split church. We were essentially our Catholic friends at that point, and they kind of revered him and lifted St. Nicholas up because of his sacrifice and the way he pretty much died a pauper with the people around him. Dutch families, they moved to America. They kept this spirit. In the 1770s, we start hearing about St. Nicholas, and his Dutch name was Sinterklaas. Washington Irving kind of brought him to the next step, and we know the... the uh, patron saint of New York became St. Nicholas. 1822, Clement Moore wrote this story. He was an Episcopalian minister. He had three daughters, and he wanted a good little story at Christmas. He wrote an account of a visit from St. Nicholas. Now, that's an interesting story if you're ever able to read through it because he was a, in a miniature sleigh and tiny reindeer. It's not what we see today. He was still that elf concept, that sacrificial monk concept. You see that. Then the twins the night before Christmas. That's that that's same. It gave us visuals and actions of a person we hadn't seen for 1,500 years. And when you look at the French children, they, they will talk about Pierre Noel. When you look to Italian children, we're talking about La Bafana. She rides a broomstick and goes down chimneys. You see some of the connection. When you're in Russia, I don't know where they came, where they went. But evidently, there's a woman named Babushka. And Babushka, at some point, tried to divert the wise men from seeing baby Jesus. So at this point, she is always now giving gifts by the bed of children, hoping that one of those babies in those beds is Jesus, and he'll forgive her for trying to get the wise men going somewhere else. It's a tough one. It's a hard one to follow. We don't get any history from that one that doesn't help us at all over here. And so my, my whole question was that, didn't Jesus grow up at some point? Maybe he's still a baby in bed thousands of years later. I don't know. But when you look at it, much of what we know, we, we come to the, the 20th century, we see the beginning of that. The, the Santa Claus, the way we see him today, comes from Coca-Cola. Commercialism. They helped us. All of that comes around. But I want to remind you that all of this is to say Even if sometimes we're diverted from our attentions and our focus gets off track, all of us, because we're created in the image of God, want to give. No matter what, you know, no matter how you celebrate this season, hopefully your focus is right, you're correct, you're on track. But when you look at it, Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And this one time of the year, When you can have 750,000 extra jobs and a 3% boost in the economy, that means we all, there's something down deep we just want to be able to give to someone else. Now, as Christian people, the greatest gift we can give is the message of Christ. Can you save anybody? No. But can you share the message of Christ? Sure. 
you can be that one evangelist that's able to, to be in the right place at the right time to, to share a message with someone who needs it. Let's take these worldly examples. Let's not fight them. Now, some of you, you may want to say, I don't want that part of our Christmas. That's between you and the Lord. But I can take presents, and I can make them a beautiful thing. I can look at fruit, and when my kids get fruit, and, oh, fruit in the stocking. Why isn't there fun in there? When they say that, we can remind them of the fruits of the Spirit, or I can remind them that God gave the greatest gift. And because of that, I want to be able to give something to you. Jesus is good. He's the perfect gift. So as we give gifts this Christmas, let's remember the greatest gift ever given. And who is that? Jesus. He's the one we celebrate. He's the one who came. God gave the best thing that he had so that you and I can have life and he didn't have to. Kind of like Christmas. I don't have to give anybody anything. But isn't it more fun than being a miser? Isn't it a little more fun? Sometimes the best thing you can give is just a little bit of your time to someone else by sharing that beautiful message of Christ. Let's remember that without Christ, we have no life. And let's celebrate by giving and helping others this season.